and we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. President Trump, who is now impeached for a second time, will have to soon face a trial in the Senate accused of inciting an insurrection. <laughs> This deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol happened while the vice president and members of Congress were inside, certifying the electoral votes, confirming Joe Biden as the president-elect. One week ago, on January 6th, there was an act of insurrection perpetrated on the Capitol of the United States, incentivized by the president of the United States. Attorney Alan Dershowitz, who was on the president's first impeachment defense team, says the First Amendment shields the president. They're trying to impeach him in violation of the First Amendment. The speech he made, which I disapprove of thoroughly, I think he was wrong to give it. But the speech he made was completely protected by the Constitution. Dershowitz cites the 1969 landmark Supreme Court case of Brandenburg v. Ohio. Clarence Brandenburg was a Ku Klux Klan leader charged with advocating violence with hate speech against African Americans and Jews. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of Brandenburg, saying that hate speech could not be prosecuted, quote, except where such advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. I unequivocally condemn the violence that we saw last week. Violence and vandalism have absolutely no place in our country and no place in our movement. The president condemned the violence in a video statement one week after the attack, but some experts say that won't absolve the president. If that's his defense that I thought it was going to be peaceful, it became apparent very quickly it was not peaceful. Uh, when they started to surge toward the doors, that would have been the time that anybody who really had the defense that it wasn't incendiary, that they thought it was peaceful, would have sent a tweet, would have held a press conference immediately, would have made it known, stop, desist, don't go in the Congress once they were in the Congress. Former U.S. Attorney David Katz says the president's legal team will have a hard time making a case for First Amendment protection of his speech. Uh, I don't agree that the president has a defense. I think that his speech was incendiary and I think it moved people to action. Uh, one of the reasons I think Dershowitz's um, argument won't win the day is because Trump said things like fight like hell. And the House members who will be prosecuting the case agree. In their supporting documents, they say the president's speech was not constitutionally protected because he is not a private citizen, free to say whatever he wants without accepting the consequences or recognizing the effects it might have on our system of government. Trump's defense team will also have an additional challenge in this trial, since the House prosecutors and the Senate judge and jury were all in danger by the January 6th riot. I think Trump's in big trouble in the Senate because it will dawn on these senators. It will dawn on their families. Uh, it will dawn on the, uh, the, the wife or the husband of a senator. They could have been a widow or widower. Their family could have not had uh, the senator or congressperson who was a member of that family. Trump risked the lives of all of those people. They were a lynch mob. They'd set up a gallows uh, they were screaming, hang Mike Pence. All right, Chanley Painter, Court TV legal correspondent, is with us live now. Chanley, the argument that Trump didn't commit a crime of incitement and that his words were protected by the First Amendment makes sense, but a bit of an uphill battle. It really is. Trump's defense is expected to really hang its hat on that iconic free speech case of Brandenburg v. Ohio. Now, remember, Brandenburg has this sort of two-pronged test that a court or I guess the Senate would look at here. And the first one is the speech is directed to inciting imminent lawlessness. And the second part, the speech is actually likely to achieve its results. So here, there probably wouldn't be much doubt about the second prong likely to incite because Trump's speech did cause lawlessness at the Capitol. But there may be some issue with the first prong of directed 
incitement. Some experts think that Trump's word would have had to explicitly say what the rioters did in the case and read literally they don't incite the violence there. So his defense probably would say he didn't intend it by those words. But a lot of experts, Ted, like David Katz, says that this Brandenburg rule and really the First Amendment shouldn't apply to the president. Let's listen. The president is not an ordinary official, and the Brandenburg test is really uh, based on whether you can be criminally prosecuted, whether you can be jailed for a speech. Um, and uh, Brandenburg uh, himself was someone who gave a speech that probably was not very wise to give, but he was someone who had no power. You also look at whether the incitation is for something that's imminent, um, and there was no imminence to what Brandenburg was saying. But Trump's was Trump's is a terrible case, uh, even if he were a criminal defendant. The president has all sorts of other standards that the president has to live up to. And Congress can set those standards you know, within reason. Uh, it has to be something I think that the public will accept. But I don't think the public would have any trouble with the president being held to this standard. In support of that higher standard, the members of Congress have said that the words of the president, quote, shake a nation. And so he should have this higher standard, which should be, quote, that his conduct threatens the constitutional order. But Trump's behavior after the riot could hurt him. In fact, that delay in posting a video and condemning the rioters could be used against him to show that he did intend to intend to incite an insurrection, Ted. Did Katz uh, throw out any other possible defenses? He did, absolutely. Throw, he threw out some defenses. Given that the charge here is incitement of an insurrection, he believes that the defense will probably go back to that speech on January 6th and try to focus on that. Let's listen to what he said. One of them might be actually advice of counsel, but I don't think that any of that would go over. I mean, if he said that speech of mine was vetted by some lawyer, First of all, we haven't seen the lawyer come forward. And there's all kinds of rules on reliance of advice of counsel. One thing is you have to make a full disclosure to the lawyer. And I don't think that there's been any kind of full disclosure to the lawyer of exactly what it was Trump was going to say. In other words, some lawyer would have to know that he was going to deliver those exact words uh, in the speech. Trump would have had to deliver those words. And you'd have to have all these other things known by the lawyer before the lawyer's opinion would even get you to first base that supposedly some lawyer vetted and approved that speech. I don't think that we're going to have that. Katz further points out that the House members prosecuting President Trump could point to the other speeches made on January 6th that Trump sat there and listened to, like his attorney, Rudy Giuliani's speech. Both had fighting words, according to Katz, and that could be used against him. He also said that a possible defense to the delay in condemning the rioters could be that he just froze. It was so surprising that his words would do that, that he froze. And he also points out that the defense would likely call or have the ability to call witnesses even expert witnesses. They could even call some of the protesters, Ted, in his defense to say, no, we weren't incited by the president's words. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, let's face it. A lot of politicians here, uh, their goal is not only get Trump out of office, which he is. Uh, the voters have, have done that. He'll be, he'll be out of office before this begins uh, in the Senate. The other goal, though, is to make it so he can never run for federal office again. How does that work? That is a remedy. That's a possible remedy to impeachment here. But it's important to remember that they don't get to that remedy until a two thirds vote of the Senate votes to convict or a conviction of impeachment is in place. Then they would move to this remedy, which takes a majority vote. David Katz explained it to me. Let's listen. The remedy after conviction would be that there would be a vote. And if by a majority the Senate agreed, after the uh, conviction in the Senate, which just means convicted of impeachment, not convicted to go to jail or to go, you know, be in the criminal, uh, you know, setting uh, to be in a federal uh, prison. Uh, but if he were convicted in the Senate, they would then take a vote. And if by a majority uh, they said that he should be uh, never allowed to serve again, then he could never hold any public federal office again, including, of course, he could not run for or be president in 2024. 
So they can only borrow from office if he is first impeached. So if they have the votes to do that, then they can move on to this remedy of preventing him from running for, for federal office. Again, it happened to Andrew Johnson. He was not impeached, so they couldn't do it to Andrew Johnson. They couldn't do it to President Bill Clinton. The other time, the president has been impeached. Uh, and it's interesting, it's two-thirds to impeach him, find him guilty of that, but only a majority on the remedy. Um, it's looking, this is not going to happen until Trump's out of office. Um, legal scholars differ on whether or not the Senate can still impeach a private citizen. Who, who decides that? Is that the Supreme Court? It could be very likely so in this situation, because like you said, it's likely this impeachment trial will not happen until President Trump is no longer a sitting president. Now, if you speak to Alan Dershowitz, he believes that the Constitution no way provides for a, a Senate to impeach someone who is no longer in office. But other experts disagree with that, saying that there actually is precedent for jurisdiction for the Senate to move forward with a trial, even though the federal officer has stepped down or resigned, and let's listen to that. There is a precedent. Grant had a secretary of war in about the 1870s, I guess it would have been. And that secretary of war resigned uh, immediately before the Senate was to begin his trial. Even though he resigned his office, the Senate went ahead anyway. Now, the irony was that the Senate didn't have a two thirds majority, but they had a big fight over whether there was jurisdiction to uh, convict someone after they were no longer in office. So uh, Trump was definitely timely impeached. He was timely charged because he's the sitting president. The issue that would be raised is whether there's still jurisdiction for the Senate trial, but based on Grant's secretary of war, I think that uh, there is jurisdiction. In that impeachment trial, the star witness, actually, Ted, was General Custer of Custer's Last Stand. He was the star witness for Grant's Secretary of War impeachment trial, who had resigned right before the trial. But the Senate decided, hey, let's vote to see if we have jurisdiction, a majority vote. They did, and then they were able to proceed with the trial. He ended up he was not impeached back then. So that's what the Senate is saying. Even if Trump's not in office, we can still vote by a majority, retain jurisdiction, and go forward. Of course, we can assume that Trump would contest their ability to maintain jurisdiction. And, of course, that would go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court would probably decide. All right. That's a Quite a legal and history lesson, Professor Painter. Thank you. Uh, maybe we'd be excused. Uh, thank you. You may be excused. We appreciate it. Have a I wonderful weekend. I won't give you weekend. a test. <laughs> All right. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Chanley. Thanks,